All right. Welcome, everyone, to Hannah's thesis defense. I'm Scott Hamilton, her major advisor here at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And we'll do a little housekeeping stuff first before I start an introduction of Hannah. So just want to remind everyone, uh, please keep your microphones muted and your videos off during the presentation. Please don't try to unmute yourself. At the end of Hannah's talk, uh, there'll be an opportunity for everyone to ask questions live if they would like. So if you'd like to ask a question at that point, you can use the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen uh, and click on the raise hand feature. And at that point, we will call on people and we'll ask you to unmute yourselves. And at that point, you're also welcome to turn on your video and, uh, and ask Hannah a question. At the very end, when we're done with questions, we'll ask everyone to unmute themselves and turn on their videos and give Hannah a big congratulations. And then after that, we'll ask everyone to leave except for Hannah's thesis committee and we'll stay around and, and ask her a few more questions and finish everything out. All right, with that, so short little introduction about Hannah. There we go, getting my screen to work. So she started out as a very curious youngster spending time on the beach. You can see very stylish as well, preparing herself for field work with all the protective gear that she needed to stay out of the sun. And like many students, right, she was uh, you know, very excited as a youngster to spend a lot of time with marine life. And I think that helped you know, set her off on the path that she's currently on. So exploring, hanging out with animals with jaws, claws, and spines. So here she is uh, you know, kissing a cute little dolphin. Catching a piranha, luckily not kissing that piranha. Cuddling little alligators, luckily not kissing the alligators. <laughs> Playing with sea urchins, luckily not kissing the sea urchins. And hanging out with lobsters as well, luckily not kissing those lobsters. But she was also very comfortable in and out of the water, in the surf, right? And this was really great for when she came here to Moss Landing. So she's spending time scuba diving, uh, working for in our surf zone project, getting beaten up in the surf and all that. Right. And on an athletic side as well, she was, you know, I think pretty much like me, you know, much more comfortable in the water than above the water. And uh, so she was, you know, really excellent in uh, competitive swimming. There was her uh, high school team, New Jersey state champions in swimming. And when she went to college, she switched over to rowing. And, you know, I played water polo and swam in college. And the people that did rowing, you know, they were the ones that, you know, they just had to persevere through lots of pain, emotionally, physically. And so I knew that, you know, Hannah was going to be a pretty tough cookie when she came here to Moss Landing. She's also pioneering the new sport of floating yoga. Right, Hannah did her undergraduate degree at the College of William and Mary. So that's where she was doing the rowing stuff I showed earlier. And what really caught my eye is that she did an undergraduate honors thesis where she was studying uh, the mechanisms of filter feeding in American shad. And so there she's holding a model of that fish there and basically studying how you know, their gill rakers function and uh, to help filter out particles uh, from the water column. When she came to Moss Landing Marine Labs, she got very you know, involved in the community, developed some really close friendships and a few other little highlights. She was a recipient of the Sydney Lundstrom Memorial Scholarship. Uh, she was pretty busy while she was, a lot of the time she was here, she was working for Jocelyn as the assistant for the environmental health and safety. And so in this role, she helped with, you know, doing lab inspections and chemical inventories and disposing of hazardous waste and all that. I know she was really helpful to my lab and, and many others in keeping us well organized. Uh, Hannah also served as the teaching assistant, both for Max's chemical oceanography class and for Gita's statistics or sampling and experimental design class. Back before COVID, uh, when we had the open house in person, she was also the graphic design and volunteer coordinator and helped out a lot with that. I guess it was probably the last in-person in open house event that we had. Mm -hmm. And she also worked for me as a research assistant on our surf zone MPA, uh, Marine Protected Area Monitoring Project. So swimming in the waves, pulling beach scenes like you can see down in the bottom, sorting fishes and all that sort of stuff. All right, Hannah is also a very talented artist. So three of the four years she was here, she had the winning design for the open house t-shirt contest. And you can see those three there, which are really fantastic. 
I especially love the one this year with we're all, you know, everyone has their little COVID mask on. She designed some logos for the different labs for my lab, which we still need to make some t-shirts or hats for that one. And for Edith's yeah. Vertebrate Ecology yeah. Lab. And very creative, right? In many of her artistic, her artistic pursuits. Right, for her thesis research, she was also a trendsetter in different types of underwater headgear. So the best wetsuit I've ever seen with her <laughs> wetsuit ears and her post-dive birthday tiara, rocking that one. For her thesis, which Hannah will tell you about shortly, she studied the effects of ocean acidification and hypoxia on stress and growth hormone responses in juvenile blue rockfish. So this little critter here, which involved her doing a lot of field work, going out diving, trying to outsmart them and catch them with hand nets, bringing them back into the lab, rearing them in different pH and oxygen conditions, working with a very temperamental seawater system, and then doing a lot of lab work you know, to assess their hormone levels. Um, all the hormone stuff was outside of my expertise. And so Hannah really showed a lot of independence figuring out how to do this. She brought in experts with Cheryl and Gita, who are committee members, and, and worked a lot with John Geller's lab as well to figure out how to kind of do the, the precise measurements of, of cortisol and growth hormones in her fish. She also had to deal with a lot of adversity during COVID. She had to work very independently. Normally she probably would have had an army of undergrads helping her do her experiments, but she pretty much had to do everything by herself, just kind of Hannah and Alora locked in a little trailer down at the shore lab. But she did, uh, Hannah did have one experience where she was able to mentor a undergraduate student it was a virtual mentorship last summer through CSU and these research for experience for undergrads program. And so that was a great experience in mentoring as well. Diving interlude. This is going to be the next big thing on TikTok, guaranteed. <laughs> oh, it already was. <laughs> oh, it already was. I missed it. Yeah, it was a TikTok trend that I was doing underwater. <laughs> That's because I don't do social media. <laughs> nice. All right. I couldn't finish this intro without showing Anna's cats, right? So she shows lots of loving care for little kitties. My favorite, of course, is when she takes her cat out on a walk with a leash. Awesome, that is a special cat. In addition to showing loving care for her kitties, she also shows loving care for the fishies, right? And so you can see, even as an early age there, she was drawn to, uh, you know, Aquaria and being an Aquarius. When she was here at Moss Landing, she spent a couple of years working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium also as an Aquarius assistant doing animal care, tank cleaning, and food prep in the jellyfish and other schooling fish exhibits. And then as of April this year, she left Moss Landing and moved uh, to Baltimore to work for the University of Maryland and their Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology. So she's their lab animal technician. Uh, she does the husbandry for their aquaculture research facility. She supervises the daily operations of their zebrafish facility. And she does a lot of work training staff and students and managing all the animal care protocols and, and lots of other things. So we're very excited for Hannah uh, for this next step in her career. But, you know, potentially if this doesn't work, there are a couple more options maybe on her artistic side. So one, you know, maybe a Medieval Times performer, or maybe the next Targaryen on HBO's House of the Dragon. She's got the whole setup. She's ready to go. Or last but not least, like Tobias okay. here in Arrested Development, you know, maybe she'll try out for Blue Man Group. He was not successful, but I bet she would be. Or she could be the founding member of Blue Woman Group. You know, just in case. All right. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce Hannah, right? And she's going to be telling you what she did for her thesis. Oh, boy. Right. Was not expecting that last one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I'll, I'll share my screen and kind of just dive into it. So um, there we go. Oops. All right, so thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Um, but I will just begin my talk now. Um, so the title of my thesis is The Effects of Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia on Stress and Growth Hormone Responses in Juvenile Blue Rockfish. So just a quick overview of the talk. Um, we're gonna first talk about some background information um, to kind of get a precedent sent for why I'm asking the questions that I'm asking, um, followed by objectives and hypotheses. Um, moving then into the methods, so what I did, uh, then the results, the what I found, what I got, and uh, finally some overarching conclusions that I got. And this overview will be at the top of the screen the whole time, kind of highlighted with where we are in the talk for you to kind of um, jog your memory about where we are. <clears throat> 
So moving into the introduction, um, the first thing that I would like to talk about is anthropogenic climate change in Monterey Bay, specifically two different um, very prevalent uh, stressors in the area. So the first being ocean acidification or OA, which I will be referring to uh, it as OA for the remainder of this presentation, um, which is defined as the decrease in ocean pH as a result of the ocean's uptake um, of carbon dioxide. Um, so OA is affected by the release of CO2 into the atmosphere, where it is then dissolved into our oceans, alternating the carbonate chemistry, um, causing the water to become more acidic. And you can see down in this graph here from a Monterey Bay condition report since the mid to late 90s, this um, higher instance or higher cases of high CO2 events. So a strong trend towards increasing magnitude of low pH events in Monterey Bay. The second stressor um, I'm concerning myself with is hypoxia, which is defined as lower concentrations of dissolved oxygen or DO, like I will be referring to it as, um, in the water. Um, this deoxygenation is largely in response to warmer ocean temperatures. You can think of this as carbonated soda, as it rooms up, uh, it warms up to room temperature, it off gases a lot of its bubbles and becomes flat. The ocean is doing largely the same thing with dissolved oxygen. As it gets warmer, this oxygen can be off gassed, causing lower oxygen conditions. Um, also here in Monterey Bay, we have things like increased stratification of the water column, which causes less surface mixing and subsurface mixing, as well as shoaling of the oxygen minimum zone um, and internal wave action, all of which kind of contribute to hypoxic events in the area. Again, looking at this Monterey Bay condition report down below, you can see since the mid 90s, this strong trend towards lower oxygen content in Monterey Bay. So these two stressors are known to occur together. So on the right here, we have a graph showing a very strong positive relationship between dissolved oxygen and pH in Stillwater Cove, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, but that is the dive site where I collected all of my fish. Um, so really strong instances of low dissolved oxygen occurring alongside instances of low pH. Um, and lower pH and DO we know are more pronounced in eastern boundary currents like the California current system due to the upwelling of deep waters to the surface. Um, but all of this is to say that looking at these two stressors individually will not give us the full picture of what the fish are experiencing in their natural habitats. So what is upwelling? I mentioned it earlier. Um, upwelling is very prevalent in California, and I'm sure we've all talked about it in our thesis defense, um, but it is these surface winds that are blowing southward, so from north to south of the coast of California, um, and they act as a way to displace surface waters offshore. And when you're getting displaced water, water must replace it. So the water that is replacing that displaced surface water is from depth. So it's deeper, colder, more nutrient rich water. We also know that the pH of newly upwelled waters has a higher partial pressure of CO2 and is therefore more acidic. And we also know that the DO content is lower in upwelled waters in comparison to normal coastal surface waters. Um, and this is because of products of respiration at depth. So in surface waters where you have a strong interaction between microbes and sunlight, you get net photosynthesis. Whereas at depth where you do not have the um, influence of sunlight, you get net respiration. Um, and down at the bottom here is the chemical equation for respiration, where you can see organic matter and oxygen depleting and being converted into CO2, H2O, nutrients, and energy. Um, but more focused in, you can see, again, this uh, oxygen content is depleting and CO2 um, content is accumulating just based off respiration. So upwelling itself is also predicted to change um, under climate change stressors. So Bakun et al. Um, hypothesized for increased upwelling. And um, the background information for this is just those upwelling favorable winds are created by a high atmospheric condition over the ocean and a low atmospheric condition over the continent. Um, so Bakun et al. is hypothesizing that the differential between these two atmospheric conditions creating those winds will increase. So you're going to have increased strength of those upwelling favorable winds, increased transport of 
water offshore and therefore in increased volume of low pH and low DO water to coastal surface waters. So how do these two stressors affect fish? Ocean acidification, um, going into the literature, we know that it affects things like al altered acid base regulation, weakened immune and nervous system function, altered sensory system function, behavioral changes, decreased growth and body condition, as well as altered life history development and survival. On the hypoxia side, we know there are things like behavioral changes, differential energy allocation towards growth and reproduction, as well as physiological and metabolic changes, things like reduced anaerobic scope and increased ventilation rate, as well as decreased hemoglobin and O2 binding rates in the blood. Um, but all of these that I've just listed are sublethal effects of each of these stressors, um, but they have also caused die-offs in fish populations in extreme cases. So environmental stressors like these, OA and hypoxia, they are known to affect the physiology of fish. So down below is a schematic of the generalized stress response um, by fish. So you can see they sense some sort of stressor. Uh, here we're focusing on these chemical environmental stressors um, where they then have a sweep of different responses. The first being the primary stress response or increases in hormone levels. There's the secondary stress response, which are anything like metabolic changes or changes in immune system function, as well as tertiary responses, so changes in whole animal health um, and behavioral changes. Um, so I'm going to focus a lot on this primary stress response, this differential change in, in hormone concentrations in the blood. Um, so we will dive a bit more into that now. So first and foremost, what are hormones? What are they doing? Um, these are chemical signaling molecules that regulate cellular physiology and gene expression by re responding to environmental variations. They can be steroids and cortisol, which I'm using here as a proxy for stress, is a good example of a steroid hormone, or they can be proteins. So IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1, which I'm using here as a proxy for growth, um, is a good example of a protein hormone. Um, each of these have the same goal at a target cell to regulate cellular physiology and gene expression. The only difference here is how they get into target tissues. So steroid hormones can pass directly through the lipid bilayer of cells, whereas uh, protein hormones require a bit more mediation by receptors and subsequent cascading of signaling. So the hormonal uh, response to stressors is this activation of the hypothalamus pituitary interrenal axis or HPI axis in the fish. Um, cortisol is the major hormone produced by this HPI axis in response to stress, and it is released in the blood to circulate. Um, and it is known that cortisol um, changes very rapidly, cortisol concentrations, and you get this peak cortisol um, sometime between 40 minutes to an hour, um, where it is then kind of, uh, as it gets uptake um, at target cells, you get this slow recovery to some eventual recovery point of cortisol. So here's just a, a different kind of schematic about this primary stress response. So you could see hypothalamus, pituitary, and renal um, at the head kidneys of the fish. Um, but cortisol is cleared from the blood by, again, uptake at target cells and modification of gene expression. Um, and on the schematic here, you can see um, kind of these known tissue level effects of cortisol in the cell. So on the other side, growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, um, regulates growth um, stimulating regulates growth by stimulating growth-promoting pathways in tissues. Um, so we know that these levels are directly impacted by cortisol, um, but more recently there has been consideration um, of IGF-1 itself as a stress-related hormone. Um, so down below, again, I have this predicted IGF-1 stress response where you potentially see it increase a bit up front to kind of match that peak level of cortisol. Um, but the most important part here is this down-regulation of IGF-1 predicted um, where you would have less IGF-1 in response to stressors. So how do other environmental stressors um, act on these hormones? So increased cortisol has been seen with stressors like salinity and temperature, various factors affecting aquaculture, so netting stress, transport stress, density stress, things like that, um, hypoxia and ocean acidification. 
uh, whereas decreased growth hormone in IGF-1 as an indicator of lower growth rate under stressors has been seen with evaluation of MPA performance, so fishing pressures, fishing stress, nutritional stress, and then salinity and temperature. But each of these are single stressor experiments, and we still know very little about how multiple stressors might work together to reduce a fish's tolerance to stress. Um, so now thinking about multiple stressors and how they may interact, um, they can do that in a few different ways. The first being additive. So an additive multiple stressor response is equal to the sum of each individual stressor. So this multiple stressor response here in purple would be equal to the sum of stressor one in green and stressor two in orange. They could also act synergistically. So where the multiple stressor response is greater than the sum of stressor one plus stressor two. The final way is antagonistically, where uh, the response of multiple stressors is less than the sum of each individual stressor. So the multiple stressor response is less than stressor one plus stressor two. So measuring cortisol and IGF-1 in juvenile rockfish. I chose juveniles um, because they're undergoing both physiological and morphological changes kind of in their stop-off point to becoming reproductive adults where they have the, the largest influence on community structure as a whole when they're reproductive. Um, so juveniles are known to be kind of under this base level of stress that adults counterparts like don't experience. Um, and then you throw environmental uh, stressors on top of that. So I think this juvenile stage is a really interesting one to look at. And then I chose blue rockfish because they are abundant in Monterey Bay. And the summer that I had to dive for them in 2020, they were largely the only species that recruited into Stillwater Cove, the kelp forest at Stillwater Cove. So a bit out of necessity, but um, they are also this ecologically and economically important species in Monterey Bay. So people eat them, people recreational fish for them. So they're kind of this um, really important species in the area. Um, they also have this three to five month pelagic juvenile stage before recruiting into the nearshore rocky kelp forest habitat, where they may already be experiencing um, these low DO and low pH conditions at depth. So um, that's interesting to think about because they may have some sort of increased tolerance to these stressors um, already. Um, and then we know that they do well in captivity. They've been used in my lab before, other labs, and they've also been used in hormonal assays before. So there's some precedent to using them as a laboratory species. So now putting it all together, my thesis is looking at um, the effects of ocean acidification, hypoxia, and the combination of the two on juvenile blue rockfish primary stress response. So looking at cortisol and IGF-1 concentrations, Secondary stress response, I'm measuring maximum metabolic rate, and the tertiary stress response, which I'll be measuring behavior and body condition. So now um, moving into my objectives and hypotheses. Um, the first question I wanted to ask was, do solitary and then combine environmental stressors of OA and hypoxia result in changes in tissue levels of cortisol and IGF-1 in juvenile blue rockfish? Uh, this led me to two different hypotheses, the first being that fish exposed to either low pH or low DO will have elevated cortisol and decreased IGF-1 compared to fish reared in control conditions. And secondarily, that fish exposed to the combined low pH and low DO will exhibit the highest cortisol and lowest IGF-1 compared to control fish and single stressor fish. The second question I'm asking here is, how does the hormonal stress response to OA and hypoxia correlate with physiological and behavioral responses in juvenile blue rockfish? Again, leading me to two different hypotheses, the first being that fish with elevated cortisol levels will exhibit physiological and behavioral responses indicative of stress, so higher maximum metabolic rate and increased anxiety. And secondarily, that there will be a positive relationship between IGF-1 and condition factor. So now um, moving into my methods, the first thing I had to do was go and get the fish. Um, so this was done at uh, about 600 juvenile blue rockfish were collected during July to August of 2020 in Stillwater Cove in Caramel Bay, California. Um, so here you can see Scott on a mission to catch some blue rockfish. 
Um, this was all done on scuba with hand nets. And then you could see the garbage can minion looking thing that he has attached to him. Um, this is where once we caught fish, which he does right here, um, we kind of pulled them out with our hands put them into um, the flow trawl, which is what it's called, so that we could bring them up to the surface and into coolers to bring back to uh, moss landing. So here now is a video of me catching some uh, blue rockfish out at Stillwater Cove to prove that I had some part in this. Um, but we worked really closely with marine ops here. We had a um, inflatable boat moored out in Stillwater Cove and we trailered another one to be able to have two boats with um, two sets of dive buddies going out every day um, during those months of diving. So next, uh, once we got them back to the lab and they were acclimated to laboratory conditions, um, it was time for some seawater um, experiments. So this is a schematic of the layout of my experimental design. So here the green is indicative of my control conditions. So this is 8.0 milligrams per liter DO and 8.1 pH. The um, orange here is the low pH stressor, so that is 7.3 for the pH. The blue is um, the low DO uh, treatment, which is two milligrams per liter DO. And then the combined stressor, which is the combination of those two, and is kind of what is projected to occur during strong upwelling events, is in purple here. So at time zero for I just uh, sampled control fish as these are pre-stressor fish. They underwent all of my different tests and trials. So they did the light dark behavior test, maximum metabolic rate respirometry test, and then were sacrificed and assayed for both cortisol and IGF-1. At the one hour and 24 hour time points, I did 20 fish per treatment um, and they were just assayed for cortisol. And then at the one week time point, I again did 20 fish per treatment um, and they underwent everything. So again, that light dark behavior test, the maximum metabolic rate respirometry test, and then were sacrificed and assayed for cortisol and IGF-1. So here is kind of a look into the OA hypoxia tent down at the Moss Landing Aquaculture Facility. Um, so this is a flow through system. So we are directly pulling um, ocean water from Monterey Bay and it is held in this 2000 liter reservoir tank where it is then gravity fed into these header tanks. And the header tanks is kind of where all the magic happened. This is where we were able to create those treatments that I just talked about. So to create a low DO condition, we were bubbling nitrogen gas into these header tanks. So as you're bubbling nitrogen into the water, you are displacing oxygen, therefore creating a lower oxygen content of that water. For the pH, we were bubbling CO2 gas into the, into the header tanks. Um, so this is increasing the partial pressure of CO2 in the water and therefore decreasing the pH. Um, and this was all done based off of feedback loops from computer software um, that we have in the trailer next to the tent. Um, you can see my IT tech buddy there probably solving all the problems I couldn't. Um, but the negative feedback here is based off of probes and controllers reading back to the computer software and um, some solenoid technology. So um, when the DO was getting too low, the solenoid would click off and the bubbles would stop. Um, and then if the DO was getting too high, the solenoid would click on and you would start bubbling that nitrogen gas again. Um, so then from these header tanks where we have just altered the seawater chemistry, it is then gravity fed again down into experimental tanks. So where I was holding the fish and rearing fish during my experimental trials. Um, and each header tank has a series of four different experimental takes associated with it. So the behavioral index that I measured was based off of this Scototaxis light dark behavior test, um, which involved a rectangular arena that was half painted black and half painted white. Um, you could see that down in this, the corner here. Um, and I didn't paint the floor uh, because the uh, paper that I was basing this experimental test off of um, basically found no significant difference between behavior, whether or not the floor was painted or not. So out of ease of video capture from above the arena, I kept the floor just a solid color. Um, each fish spent 15 minutes in this test arena, again, filmed from above. And then time spent on the dark side versus the light side uh, will give me a metric of behavioral anxiety in the fish, where more time spent on the dark side indicates more timid and anxious behavior. 
These videos were then put into a video tracking or video analysis software called EthoVision XT, um, where we basically told the um, software where the zones were, so which side was the light side, which side was the dark side, and then also told it what was the fish, so it knew what to track as it watched the video. Um, so this program helped me calculate time spent on either side of the arena, and it also measured a whole sweep of additional metrics like total distance traveled, average velocity, and time spent in motion, which I ended up converting to a total activity proxy, but I will talk about those a bit later. So the physiological index, this MMR respirometry test, I chose a chase protocol for this. So this is a um, 10 minute swim where I created this gentle vortex um, for the fish to swim against in a circular arena. So they swam for 10 minutes or until exhaustion, where they went directly into a respirometry chamber for one flush measure cycle to get oxygen consumption over that five minute period. Um, this respirometry data, this raw respirometry data was then put into a package in R called fish resp, where I used that oxygen consumption data to get maximum metabolic rate, which is a good indicator of metabolic stress. Um, then body measurements, so length and weight of all fish were taken prior to their sacrifice to calculate condition factor. And then um, samples were frozen um, to do hormone assays in the lab. So these hormone assays, again, I did 20 fish per treatment per time point. Um, so I was using ELISA kits, where, which are a very easy to use um, assay. It comes with the assay plates, the standards, and all the reagents that you need. Um, so I was using a fish cortisol ELISA assay kit, and then a fish IGF-1 ELISA assay kit. Um, so to prep the tissue and get ready for these assays, um, tissue samples had to be homogenized. So inducing cell lysis to break up the cells and kind of release the contents of the cells to be measured um, in phosphate buffered saline and then centrifuged in these micro centrifuge tubes so that the supernate could be assayed. Um, and the assay plate over here on the right, um, you can see there is a color change involved here. So these are read on a plate reader, which I have the MLML Invertebrate Zoology Lab to thank for their equipment here. Um, so those plates are read for absorbance or basically how much light is passing through that color change. And I mentioned that standards came with each of these kits. So these are standards of known either cortisol concentration or known IGF-1 concentration. So on each plate that you um, set up, you have a series of standards that you know the cortisol or IGF-1 content so that when you get the absorbance reading back from the plate reader, you can plot the two on a line and generate an equation so that any of your sample absorbance values can then be converted into uh, hormone concentrations. So finally here with the methods, my data analysis, I used ANOVA analysis for within treatment analysis of the cortisol concentrations along multiple time points, a student's t-test for within treatment analysis of IGF-1, so before and after. Um, again, ANOVA for the between treatment analysis, so between treatment analysis of cortisol, IGF-1, my physiological metrics, and my behavioral metrics. And then I did this additional regression analysis to investigate any relationships between the physiological and behavioral metrics and the, the hormone concentrations. So now uh, moving into my results here, we are going to start off looking at the within treatment analysis, so looking across the multiple time points for cortisol. Starting off here with the control group, as you can see that there is this significant difference between time points within the control group, um, largely because of this unexplained high cortisol concentration at the one week time point. Um, I mentioned earlier in the background that at this juvenile stage, the fish are typically under more stress just in general compared to adult counterpoints. Um, so it's possible by this one week time point, these juvenile fish were just a little bit more sensitive to smaller uh, experimental tanks in comparison to the holding tanks that I had them um, in holding. Uh, 
a research paper out of Cheryl Logan's lab over at CSUMB, Klein et al. 2020, also was able to report differential gene expression at a one week time point in juvenile blue rockfish. And again, um, back in the background, I mentioned that differential gene expression and um, mediating gene expression is one of the known major actions of cortisol at a cellular level. Um, so knowing that we see differential gene expression at this time point in juvenile blue rockfish, it's possible that this increased cortisol level here at this one week time point is um, indicative of that adaptive differential gene expression, adaptive stress. So now looking at the low DO group, again, you could see the significant difference between the time points within the low DO group. Um, and you can see this activation of the stress response indica uh, indicated by this higher one hour cortisol concentration in comparison to these uh, pre-stressor levels. Um, and so we have this peak, not quite a peak here, but this activation of the stress response. And then um, there was a slight increase in cortisol concentration after one week at low DO con uh, conditions. So again, if you remember back in the background, I talked about the classic peak and recovery of cortisol concentration. Um, this kind of goes against that. So it has a activation of the stress response, this higher cortisol level, but even increases further after one week. So now looking at the low pH group, as you can see, again, there's a significant difference between the time points within the low pH group. Um, but this time we see this classic peak and fall of cortisol concentration in the low pH group. Um, so this is a very high peak and strong activation of the stress response and subsequent recovery down to some recovery point of cortisol levels. So here now looking at the combined group, Again, there's a significant difference between these time points within this combined group. Again, where you could see this activation of the stress response indicated by this increased cortisol uh, in comparison to the pre-stressor conditions. But this time, instead of accumulating cortisol concentration or that classic recovery, we are seeing it basically um, no change in cortisol concentrations after this initial activation. Um, so now looking at all of these graphs side by side, you can kind of see that differential activation of the stress response where you get this really strong activation of the stress response by uh, indi indicated by this release in cortisol and the subsequent um, recovery of that uh, peak level. Whereas over in the low DO and low pH and combined groups, you're seeing this more mild, more subtle activation of the stress response, but either an increase in concentration of cortisol or a level of uh, cortisol that's being held steady. So in these more metabolically stressful conditions, we're potentially seeing a more mild activation of the stress response, but a longer duration of the stress response. Um, so here is an interaction plot for a two-way ANOVA analysis that I did. So looking at the interaction between treatment and time point, which you could see here is very significant. Um, so knowing this, we just basically have to now go within those uh, time points and look at treatment variation amongst these um, fish. So here, looking at this one hour time point, you could see a significant difference between treatment groups at one hour, which is largely due to this high or highest peak cortisol concentration belonging to this low pH group. Then the other interesting thing here is that this multiple stressor response, this combined stressor response appears to be um, antagonistic effects of low DO and low pH. So again, if you remember from the introduction where this multiple stressor response is less than the sum of the DO and pH single stressors. So now looking at the 24 hour time point, largely the same trends here. Again, significant difference between treatment groups at the 24 hour time points, largely contributed to this highest 24 hour cortisol concentration belonging to the low pH group. And then again, this combined multiple stressor response appearing to be antagonistic effects of the low DO and low pH. <clears throat> 
Now looking at the one week time point here, um, there is no significant difference between the treatment groups at the one week time point. Um, so this is largely due to that unexplained high cortisol in the control group. Um, but essentially, even when you don't look at the control group, there is still no significant difference between the cortisol concentrations here. Um, so there's almost this equilibration of the cortisol levels between the treatments at one week. Um, so here I've just thrown up the pre-stressor level to bring home the point that um, no treatment adapted back down to pre-stressor levels, even including the control group, um, after one week. So uh, one week in these fish would not be enough time to adapt back down to pre-stressor levels of cortisol. So here, just as a cortisol review, looking again at my hypotheses and the results that we got, um, I hypothesized that fish exposed to environmental stressors will have increased cortisol compared to control. So yes and no. Um, we did see this result at the one hour and 24 hour time points, um, but at the one week, we did not. And then the second hypothesis here was that combined pH and DO treatment will have the highest cortisol, which again is not what we saw. So looking back at the data, again, we saw this antagonistic response. So where this combined multiple stressor response is less than the sum of each individual stressor. And then the other uh, kind of take home point here is that uh, changes in cortisol appear to be largely driven by low pH as seen by this highest peak cortisol in the low pH group. Um, so now moving on to the IGF-1 side of things, um, you can see here that there was no significant difference between treatment groups at the one week time point. Um, so kind of trying to figure this out for myself um, in the literature, when you look at short term stress, so short term stress uh, predicts this initial increase of IGF-1 to try and help mobilize energy stores and increase protein production to mitigate physiological stress. Whereas on the flip side, long-term stress appears to predict the suppression of IGF-1 due to just how energetically costly that protein production is. So there is likely these major trade-offs between the upregulation and downregulation of IGF-1 on different timescales throughout the stress response. And I think the one week time point that I chose um, just kind of landed somewhere in between those two. So I was detecting no difference between my treatment groups. So again, I have just put on this graph, the pre-stressor level to kind of bring home the point that there was no significant change in IGF uh, levels before and after the seawater experiments. So again, um, in IGF-1 review, I hypothesized that fish exposed to environmental stressors will have decreased IGF-1 in comparison to control. This is not the result that we saw. Um, and then a secondary hypothesis being that combined pH and DO treatment will have the lowest IGF-1, which again is not the result that we saw. We saw that no change in IGF-1 after one week. So now moving into my physiological and behavioral metrics, first up is maximum metabolic rate. So you can see here that there is a significant difference between treatment groups at the one week largely due to this significantly higher maximum metabolic rate in the low DO single stressor and the combined stressor. Um, so this is kind of a funky result that I found. Um, most of the time you would expect a lower maximum metabolic rate. So these fish that are under a more metabolically stressful conditions would try and use oxygen less. But my fish are showing higher rates of, um, of O2 consumption in low DO and combined fish. Um, so this is possibly showing that initial increase in energy mobilization during the stress response, rather than the more commonly reported decrease in MMR that are seen in longer term studies. Um, so here is part of that linear regression analysis that I did, um, looking for any relationship between cortisol and MMR. And as you can see, there's no significant relationship between cortisol and maximum metabolic rate. 
Um, so now looking at the Scototaxis behavior test, um, here you can see these heat maps and fish motion track that Ethovision gave us at the end of each trial. Um, so you can see in a more extreme case here, the fish spent some time, not a lot, on the light side, but overwhelmingly more time on the dark side. And this one, a more kind of average case where some time was spent on the light side, but still a heavy preference for that dark side. And then here, reiterated again in this fish track um, where you can see it did go over into the light side, but the majority of its motion was over on this dark side. So again, there was this overwhelming preference for dark zone regardless of treatment across control all the way up to the combined treatment. Um, so this preference for the dark may stem from natural light fluctuations experienced by juvenile blue rockfish in their natural habitat of the kelp forest. So kelp is known to shade the region. Um, so they are preferentially choosing these kelp forest areas. Um, so you would think that they would actually choose this dark side um, to kind of mimic that shading effect in the kelp forest. Um, so basically here, a novel figure test or some other type of behavioral anxiety test would have been better um, knowing the study species that I was working with. So again, I decided to use these additional measurements of total distance traveled, average velocity, and an activity proxy, which I calculated um, by time spent moving divided by time spent stationary, where the higher that activity proxy is indicates more time spent stationary by the fish. Um, so yeah, moving into those results, you can see total distance, average velocity, and activity metric here, um, but we saw no behavioral differences between the treatments here. Um, there is kind of a visual trend when looking at distance and velocity with the combined group specifically. So here you can see this non-significant visual trend towards less distance traveled and lower velocity of movement in these um, combined fish. Um, so overall, blue rockfish appear to be very robust to any behavioral changes as seen by this non-significant um, behavioral difference. Um, but there are some kind of trends that might become more pronounced on longer timescales. So I didn't just use these measurements because they were given to me by a fancy software program. Uh, there is some ecological relevance for these behavioral metrics, and they have been used before to indicate behavioral stress in fishes. Um, so some of the ecological relevance here is altered vigilance, startle response, schooling behavior, prey conspicuousness, and migration behaviors. Um, and all of these changes in behaviors, particularly in juvenile populations, can really heavily alter recruitment and community dynamics over time. Um, but again, blue rockfish appear to be largely robust to any of these behavioral changes. Um, so here is that uh, linear regression analysis for looking at the relationship between cortisol and each of these behavioral metrics. Um, and as you can see, I found no relationship between the behavioral metrics and cortisol concentration. So now moving into Fulton's K or condition factor across treatments, um, you can see here that there's a significant difference between the treatment groups at the one week time point, uh, which is largely attributed to the significantly lower condition factor in low DO and low PHDO treatment, so in the combined treatment. Um, so hypoxia is known to reduce some somatic growth um, to decrease um, oxygen demand. So in these more metabolically stressful conditions, you would expect to see lower condition factor. So a paper um, published out of my lab, Matthias and et al, 2020, did report no changes in growth rate in over many months in juvenile blue rockfish. Um, but he did not look at condition factor. So it's possible that although they're not seeing any growth rate changes, uh, this Fulton's K may be a more easily detectable effect of growth in these fish on shorter timescales. I also did a residual analysis of Fulton's K to try and standardize for the size of the fish a bit more. Um, and this trend only becomes a bit more noticeable. This time, in fact, with uh, the, all of the treatment groups being lower condition um, than that control group. But again, with um, the low DO and combined treatment groups showing the lowest condition factor. Um, so then here, we can also um, say that this multiple stressor response um, is greater than the sum of each individual stressor. So this combined treatment response seems to be showing synergistic effects of each single stressor. 
Um, so here is that linear regression analysis again to try and look at the relationship between IGF-1 and Fulton's K. Um, so there was no significant relationship between IGF-1 and condition factor, but there is this kind of non-significant negative relationship with smaller fish, so fish with lower condition factor, um, seemingly having higher IGF-1 values. Um, this is possible evidence for the upregulation of IGF-1, putting more energy and protein production into the stress response rather than growth and condition. Um, but I would need more IGF-1 time point trajectory, um, trajectory time points to be able to definitively say um, I saw any sort of upregulation or downregulation of IGF-1 uh, in these more metabolically stressful conditions. So again, a bit of the physiology and behavioral review here. Um, I predicted that increased cortisol would exhibit increased MMR and increased behavioral anxiety. Um, yes and no, I did see that increase in MMR, um, but there was no link to that MMR value and cortisol concentrations. And then with the behavioral stuff, um, I did not show any increased uh, behavioral anxiety, and there was also no link between those behavioral metrics and cortisol concentration. And then I also hypothesized that IGF-1 would have a positive relationship with condition factor. Um, and this is not the result that we saw. We saw, in fact, a non-significant negative relationship, um, which I think just illustrates how complicated the role of IGF-1 is in the hormonal stress and growth response. So again, looking at some of the take-home points here with data again, um, looking at this residual analysis of Fulton's K, we saw this potential synergistic response with the multiple stressor response being greater than the sum of each individual stressor. So the last thing I wanted to look at was any links or any relationship between the two hormones that I was measuring, so cortisol and IGF-1. Um, this is a correlation test where, as you can see, there is no significant relationship between cortisol and IGF-1. Um, but although there is no significant relationship here, there is kind of a visual trend that I would like to walk us through. So if I were to split this graph into four quadrats, you can see that in this upper right quadrant, there is no data points. Um, so to kind of discuss this a little bit more at low IGF-1 levels, we have highly variable cortisol levels, whereas at high IGF-1 levels, we have only low cortisol levels. And then on the flip side, at low cortisol levels, we have highly variable IGF-1, whereas at high cortisol levels, we only have low IGF-1. So this is possible evidence for the downregulation of IGF-1, so with higher stress equating to lower growth rates in uh, blue rockfish. Um, but again, we saw no significant um, relationship. This is just kind of a really interesting visual trend. Um, and then looking into the literature, what you would kind of expect to see out of the relationship between these two hormones. So acute stress here predicts a positive association. So where IGF-1 would very closely match the cortisol concentration trajectory. Um, so where you have high cortisol and high, IG, high IGF-1 in the same fish. Um, and then on the flip side, chronic stress predicts the opposite. Chronic stress predicts a negative association between the two, um, where you would have um, low cortisol equating to high IGF-1 and high cortisol equating to low IGF-1. Um, so this trend is largely only reported in circulating plasma concentrations of these two hormones. And if you remember, I measured these hormones at the muscle tissue. Um, so it's possible that I'm kind of getting muddled results here um, because of the specific local and cellular action of both of these hormones. And if I were to have looked in the plasma circulating concentrations, I would have seen a more clear relationship between um, the release of these hormones in response to stress. So again, um, a little bit of a review here. I hypothesized that cortisol would have high, uh, would have a negative relationship with, I, with IGF-1. Um, and again, this is not the result that we saw. So now uh, moving into my final conclusions. So first up, um, we were able to, I was able to report that there is a variation in strength and duration of activation of the hormonal stress response in juvenile blue rockfish in response to environmental stressors. More specifically, we saw the strongest activation but potential shorter duration of the stress response with the low pH single stressor. 
and a more mild activation but longer duration of elevated cortisol in the low DO and combined stressors, the more metabolically stressful conditions. Um, so these fish in these more metabolically stressful conditions are potentially spending more time under elevated cortisol con uh, conditions. So some possible long-term consequences of living with elevated cortisol is more energy towards stress mediation rather than growth and reproduction, which will affect the whole population as a whole as these fish become reproductively active. Um, and then similarly, um, we know that cortisol can be passed to offspring via cortisol and maternally derived nutrients and eggs. So again, this consequence of living with elevated cortisol is potentially passing it to your offspring and kind of setting them off on, I guess, the wrong foot. So here, I think that future studies with longer experiment runtime to get more into the chronic stress side of things, um, with more sampled time points, particularly for the IGF-1 side of things, um, and also I would have loved to include more treatments. Um, so more treatments to kind of fill out a full factorial methods design, um, as well as including some fluctuating uh, stressors to mimic upwelling conditions. So a second conclusion here is that pH mainly contributes to differences in hormonal physiology with um, antagonistic effects of each single stressor on the multiple stressor response. So here, uh, future studies, uh, I, I would love to have uh, measured cortisol and IGF-1 in blood plasma to get to that circulating level rather than potentially muddling my results with this local cellular action of each of these hormonal hormones. Um, and then if I were to look at tissues again, um, the liver tissue would be a really interesting choice. That is a very common target uh, tissue type for both cortisol and IGF-1, um, as well as gill tissue. Um, so gills are the site of acid base regulation, as well as the site of diffusion of DO into the bloodstream. So I think in terms of a target tissue type, the gill tissue would be really interesting to look at both of these hormones. A third conclusion here uh, being that DO mainly contributes to differences in metabolism and body condition uh, with potential synergistic effects of each single stressor on the multiple stressor response. Um, so here, future studies um, to include changes in each metric, so changes in condition before and after, changes in weight, changes in length, things like that, um, by more closely tracking individuals from beginning to end of the experiment, I think would be really cool. Um, and then also using a critical swimming speed protocol rather than the chase protocol that I used for maximum metabolic rate. Um, a fourth conclusion is that blue rockfish appear to be largely robust to any behavioral changes in response to OA and hypoxia. So everything we've talked about um, is kind of showing the influences of stressors on that primary and secondary stress response, whereas um, the behavioral stuff really gets to um, the tertiary stress response. So we're not seeing a lot of tertiary stress response happening in this in, in blue rockfish. Um, so Future studies, I think, with um, more closely looking at the behavioral test choice, so something like a novel tank test versus the scototaxis light dark test, um, given the impact of shading in the natural environment of blue rockfish, causing those light dark ratios to be really heavily skewed towards the dark zone. And then kind of a final overarching conclusion here, um, just that the interaction of multiple stressors can be incredibly complex and hard to predict in living fish populations, um, especially on different physiological scales and different time scales. So again, here are future studies with more focus on multiple time points, longer experiment runtime, and more treatments would really be needed to kind of tease apart any of the, the results that I saw here. Um, so one final overarching conclusion here is that while the hormonal stress response appears um, to keep up with any organismal changes in blue rockfish at current levels of OA and hypoxia, they may not remain tolerant as these events become more severe in strength and duration. So uh, physiological changes like these are very species specific. Um, so no two species will react and respond to these conditions in the same way. And blue rockfish do not just exist out there by themselves. There are lots of different um, organisms, both invert, fish, marine mammal, um, that live out there and are experiencing these environmental stressors. Um, 
And as these stressors kind of intensify and change more rapidly, there are going to be winners and losers. Um, based on my thesis here, it appears that blue rockfish may be a winner, um, but rockfish in general are long lived and late to mature, which are notoriously associated with the inability to adapt to oceanic changes quickly. So as we are changing the conditions of the ocean more rapidly, we may eventually push these blue rockfish out of their tolerance zone and they may shift from being winners to being losers. Um, and then finally, from a management perspective, juvenile fish populations have incredible predicting power on how the overall population of blue rockfish will react and change to these stressors. Um, so studies like this and future studies looking at the stress response in juvenile fish um, could become really important in informing fisheries assessment models. So now moving into my acknowledgements, I have lots of people to thank. Um, so starting off with my committee members, my principal committee member, Dr. Scott Hamilton, who you've already heard from, um, but I need to thank you for basically making my dream come true of being a marine biologist. Um, you kind of gave me the space to, oh, I'm going to cry, um, but you gave me the space to kind of hone laboratory and field skills that I will use for the rest of my career, um, and then I also need to like really thank you for almost single-handedly populating my experiments. You are like the master fish wrangler underwater. Um, so you really helped me a lot that summer, um, despite all of the health conditions you were dealing with. Um, secondly, um, Dr. Birgitta McDonald, um, you were the professor in the first class I ever took out in California. It was a physiology class. Um, and I was like immediately intimidated by your 200 slide presentations that you printed for us on the first day. Um, but if you were to go back and look at those, I was like eagerly scribbling thesis ideas in the margins. So you were a really big inspiration in, in doing a study like this. Um, and then similarly in statistics, um, you really helped me kind of become a confident statistician, um, which again is a skill that I will use throughout the rest of my career. Um, and then Dr. Cheryl Logan from CSUMB, I have to thank you for just being an overall wealth of knowledge of fish physiology. And I think even when you didn't know it, you were helping me. There was one instance where I panic called Scott from the OA hypoxia tent and you guys happened to be on the beach together just hanging out and um, you guys really helped me through some of the issues that I was having. Um, and then finally to all of you, um, I need to thank you guys for being, you know, patient and with me as I'm, you know, moved across the country and started my career out here in Baltimore um, before finishing this. Um, so you gave me the time, the space, and I guess the respect to, to be able to do that. And, and I will be forever grateful for that. So a bit of uh, more generalized thank yous. So the MLML Theology Lab um, in particular, Vivian, Melissa, Kristen, uh, you guys were all really instrumental in helping me kind of figure out the methods and, and how to use the equipment that Moss Landing Marine Labs was able to um, give me to use. Um, and then Gammon, you came and helped me a few times, um, always with hot chocolate in hand, always in a Star Wars mug, very appreciated. Um, and then Alora Yarbrough, who was my partner in crime, my partner in everything, um, thank you guys. Um, MLML Marine Ops, I need to thank. So John Douglas and Diana Steller. Um, I worked really closely with you guys while planning all of my dive trips. And as you know, planning those dive trips in the face of a, a global pandemic was not an easy task and it was really hard on me. Um, so I know we were all kind of figuring out together all of the new protocols and restrictions, um, but I, I truly wouldn't have been able to get any of that planning done uh, without you guys. Uh, the MLML admin staff, Kathleen Donahue, Michelle Keefe, Jane Webster, um, these are all just amazing women who, no matter the problem you had, they had a solution and they're just very easy to talk to. And then in particular, Jocelyn Douglas. Um, so Jocelyn was my employer, my event space, the reason I have my cat. Um, she was really just my second mom out in California. And again, with COVID restrictions and 
all of the hoops we had to jump through when all of that started, I, I truly could not have done this thesis without the guidance from you in all of that. Um, I also need to thank the MLML Invert Zoology Lab for the use of your equipment, plate reader, gloves, pipette tips, because ours were mysteriously held up somewhere um, with all of the supply chain issues. And in particular, M Melinda Wheelock, who was the one who physically ran all of our assay plates. Um, and it was really the last little bit of data that I needed to collect. So I, it, it really, really helped me get over this like massive hurdle. So thank you. Um, I need to thank my family uh, for supporting me no matter what. I was far away from all of you, but I never once felt unsupported. Um, so thank you guys. Um, and then I also need to thank my current coworkers, my ARC staff and all of the people who um, are really there for me here in Baltimore. Um, you guys kind of took a chance on me before I finished my degree. Um, and especially over the past week of insane work, um, you gave me the time and space I needed to be able to practice this talk and kind of get it out of the way. Um, so just some final more general thank yous to all of the people who really made my California adventure the most worthwhile thing I've ever done in my life, uh, furry friends included. Um, it was really amazing. It was really hard, but you guys kept that balance of work life um, at a really good level. So while we were all struggling doing our theses, we were also having some of the most fun I'll ever have in my life. Um, and I particularly need to thank Alora again um, for being by my side throughout everything. So she was my lab mate, my research partner, my roommate, my fellow cat mom. Um, so I, I really couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. Um, so now that I'm crying, I'll stop crying now and I will uh, take any questions from, from you guys. Nice job, Hannah. Thank Great you. Presentation. <laughs> and yeah, thanks for all those heartfelt words to everyone that helped you along your journey. That was really nice. All right, time for questions. Who has a question for Hannah? Remember, you can use the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. Hit the raise your hand feature and we will call on you. All right, while people are doing that, I'll ask you a question. Oh, no. Oh, it's easy. Well, I don't know. I'm just curious. So, okay. like, I mean, when fish are handled, right, that mm -hmm. can lead to some stress. And so I was wondering, like, if a fish, you know, is stressed and then it goes into a tank with, you know, other tank mates that, or not stressed in any way, haven't experienced that stress. Will will those tank mates also potentially experience a rise in cortisol? Is there any of that type of communication, hormonal signaling, or anything that happens, or does that not really happen in fish? Um. So, yes and no. Um. So there is this kind of whole kind of outbreaking part of this research, cortisol stress uh, research, where. Uh, they're trying to find uh, less stressful ways to test for cortisol. So I was really particular to make sure that I was sacrificing these animals within one minute of netting them um, so that there was minimal cortisol increase at the time of sacrificing. Um, but one of the ways in which you can test for cortisol kind of in a non-invasive way is through the water content of the water. So we wouldn't have been able to do this at our facility because it's flow through, but say in a recirculating system, you could take water and test for cortisol concentrations. Um, so that kind of gets you like a group stress level. Um, and I, I do think that that has some sort of effect on the fish as individuals, their stress level. So, you know, if there's really stressed fish in a tank with some unstressed fish, you'll kind of equilibrate to just having, you know, a normal stress level. Um, but, but yeah, that's kind of like a whole new side of the cortisol stress response research that we're seeing. Cool. Any questions from the audience? Letting you off easy. I'll ask you another one. Oh man, I did such a good job. No one has questions. No, yeah, right. So I mean, you weren't able to track individuals to, to see how they were growing over, over that week, but you did see that difference in condition. Did you mm -hmm. did you notice any differences in the 
I guess the feeding activity or, or anything like when you were observing the tanks and feeding the fish, did, was there any treatment effects that were kind of obvious or? Yeah, um, I would say that the combined fish did not eat anything that I threw in there. Whereas, you know, the low pH and control fish definitely did. Um, and as you know, I had some issues with my low DO fish. I had to restart that trial a few times. Um, but I think the metabolically stressful conditions, they in general ate less than the pH and control counterpoints. Okay, yeah, that's good. Though. Yeah, it yeah. helps explain those results. Mm -hmm. All right, how about anyone from the audience? It can't be the only one asking Hannah questions. All right, Diana. Oh, oh. <laughs> You're up. Diana, you can unmute yourself and ah. on your video if you want. I only found the thumbs up signal. So <laughs> thumbs up is I finally great. saw the hand. <laughs> Hannah, great talk. And um, I was really interested in your examination or your discussion about the dark versus light um, mm -hmm. parts of their kind of environmental situation or setting versus mm -hmm. the chemical setting that you were looking at. Yeah. And I tried to think through upwelling now and changes in OA in kelp forests. And I'm thinking about Logan's thesis. He's looking at flow mm -hmm. inside of a kelp bed versus outside. And based on your results, how would you look at or think that um, some of these variation in OA would affect newly recruited fish inside a kelp, uh, a, a barren versus inside of a dense kelp bed versus the outside. So kind of three different scenarios of no kelp um, or because they sometimes do recruit to ledges versus mm -hmm. those variations in kelp density. Yeah. So, um, and particularly you know, in Monterey Bay, where we have so much upwelling and kelp forests associated with each other. Um, there is a paper out there, I could probably send it to you, but um, they kind of found that these low pH and low DO conditions persisted longer inside kelp forests rather than on urchin barrens, just because of differential flow patterns and where things kind of slow down a little bit in the kelp forest. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really interesting question trying to look at or get to how stressful these conditions could be um, based on those two locations. And my, my guess is that uh, fish in the kelp forest potentially would be experiencing these conditions longer and would potentially be more stressed than say um, individuals that uh, kind of recruited into the urchin barrens where you're getting a lot of flushing of those water conditions. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Cheryl has a question. All right, Cheryl, feel free to unmute yourself. Cheryl, you're up. Do you want? Do you need? Sorry, us I I no. wasn't able to unmute there okay. for a second, but the. Sorry. Me. Um, no worries. Uh, great talk, Hannah. Um, I have a question about your cortisol measurements. Mm -hmm. So, as you probably know, cortisol concentrations are going to um, shift throughout the day, even mm -hmm. you know not um, in the presence of a stressor. Um, so, I was curious if you uh, corrected for that or accounted for that in your measurements. So, for example, your one hour, your twenty-four hour, and your one week measurements were, were they all measured at the same time of day? Yeah, so I, and this is largely because of COVID protocol restrictions, but was only allowed to be, you know, in any given space for a particular time. So I tried to do all of my work in the morning and I tried to get all of these um, uh, kind of big sacrifice of fish done sometime between like 8 a.m. and noon. So, you know, there might be some difference there, but um, all fish were sacrificed at some point during the, the morning. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? I'll ask one more, <laughs> then we'll let you go. Okay. So, I mean, we're gonna start a new project pretty soon with adult rockfish and you don't know mm -hmm. you're over juveniles. So I'm just, I wanted to pick your brain to see what you think about, you know, how adult rockfish 
you know, how their stress response, mm -hmm. may, you know, uh, change in response to climate change and whether, you know, whether a pregnant female may respond differently than just a non-pregnant adult rockfish in terms of yeah, cortisol. Um, yeah, so I think like the idea that juvenile fish are generally more stressed than adult counterpoints would kind of um, be the same case for like pregnant females. They are putting a lot of energy into their reproduction, into, you know, having eggs and, you know, passing off their genes to the next uh, generation. So I think that in general, those fish at like a base level would be more stressed. So potentially stressors like uh, OA and hypoxia would affect them a bit more than just, you know, male counterpoids or non uh pregnant females. Um, that's like my first thought. So yeah. I'm thinking maybe we should measure cortisol levels in our, when we get blood samples from these rockfish. Totally cool. do it. Yeah. And you can get enough blood from adults too. So especially during different stages of, of right. Education. It might be cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Diana has her hand raised again. She's <laughs> back for more. Oops. Hi. <laughs> I have two things. One, I wanted to mention um, or say, both to you and Alora, that how impressed I am with your fortitude and staying with being able to pull off a field project during COVID because that was a heroic effort. And I'm just uh, impressed with that. And two, I wanna um, ask a strange question about cortisol and predators. Okay. And if, this is just kind of musing, if, a lingcod or some mm -hmm. sort of predator ate a bunch of high cortisol um, yois. Is there the capacity during through digestion? And this is just my ignorance on biochemistry, maybe. But um, could they have elevated cortisol as a result? And how long does it last or uh, before it's reabsorbed? I mean the answer is yes. So there are a lot of studies on fish cortisol where um, instead of subjecting the fish to stressors to increase that cortisol, um, they are looking to like have a known level of cortisol in the fish. Um, and one of the methods in doing that is either injection or you can actually feed cortisol to the fish um, to get kind of a known level of cortisol in the fish. This is something that Alora actually looked into for like a brief second when we were, you know, trying to formulate our theses. Um, so I think, yes, if a lingcod were to eat like a whole bunch of yois with really elevated cortisol, um, I think in some way their cortisol levels would also be raised. Um, but I, I don't know how much and how long that would persist. Thank, thanks. Yeah. All right. I think that's a great one to end it on. So everyone who's still online, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and turn on your video and give Hannah a big congratulations and a job well done. Woo! Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Woo!